Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I hope the discussion groups proved useful and you guys had some nice conversations. Um, when you have a minute, can the group facilitator please post in the chat box any questions that came up? And we can go ahead and get those asked to Sarah and also any insights that you had about the current virtual events you're working on, what your community is doing in regards to a virtual event plan and all of that uh, good stuff. That'll be greatly appreciated and we can go ahead and get those addressed. Um, we did have a couple questions from earlier, and Sarah, I will go ahead and ask those right now. We had a question from Cassie. She asked, when COVID is behind us and life goes, goes back to normal, do you think virtual events will be the new norm? Will we go back to live conferences, events, or stay virtual? Well, I mean, look, the... Um we are we are in a time right now with virtual events like I was saying I think it's a new media and we are um, creating brand new social interactions and ways to connect with each other that we didn't have before so um, and and I think it's really effective people are having delightful experiences connecting in this way um, I really think that and let's just say like, okay, so the first wave is like, you, you'll have 10 people in a room and then it'll be 50 and then it'll be a few hundred and then it'll be a thousands, you know? And so it's gonna take a while for us to get there. Um, and even once we get back to normal, um, I think that before, after you did your event, you kind of only had your Facebook group or your Slack channel or Instagram to connect with people um, in between your next big event. And now I think that these kinds of meetings, these small group meetings um, are going to be the new normal um, for re-engagement. So, because we all know that um, that events is, is a very, um, has like a high conversion rate, you know, for customers. So why would we, why would we go back to sort of posting an Instagram story, you know, or in Facebook group when we can just keep having um, these smaller events again, what wins on the internet is sensationalism. So those big splash events plus repetition. Great, thank you. Um, one of the next questions that we had was from Jasmine. Um, and she said, are there any all-in-one platforms that you feel are close to being the ideal all-in-one? I know what you said earlier. So just to elaborate on that a bit. Zoom more. is the closest that we have. So we are currently in it. And, and we all now like have become, I feel like in some way or another, you know, masters of Zoom. Uh, so this is what we've got, folks. Awesome, I'm still learning everything, something new about Zoom every day. Um, from Astrid, one big question is about organizing virtual conferences, but also it's harder to make money on virtual events. Now people just assume they are free, but will always be free. How can you approach that challenge? Yeah, so I mean, look, if you were making, if the only way you were making money from your events was be, was through ticket sales, you're probably, you know, that's a tough business, right? That single, single ticket purchase. Um, I actually created like an ROI calculator. If you go to happily.io slash ROI, you can take a look at it. And the way that we think about um, money is um, it's, it's always best, I think, to have a product like so, for instance, like CMX is an event and it makes some some money maybe from ticket sales. But really, the, the value there is in the LTV of people purchasing the, the Bevy product. Right. So um, so the way that like I kind of think about. Uh, I kind of think about the way to make money from it is you're having another product that you're selling and these events like can be free and freeze helps helps with your, you know, awareness and bringing more people to the table. But now, as you think about storytelling and filmmaking, right, and like advertising on your stories or product placement into your stories or smaller webinars and like small group conversations. These are all new ways to make revenue and generate revenue on your virtual event that you didn't maybe really develop as much when you were doing them in person. So um, I, I, I should, I, I'll do, I'll do like another, I'll do a talk or a video or something on like how to make money from events. But yeah, I think it's just like a, a new approach to advertising and sponsorship. Ticket sales is going to be, you know, marginally help you, but some other additional product or really thinking through a membership subscription product might be a way to go. That's that. Great. And to kind of tie 
in to that last question, we have another one from David. And he asks, as events pivot to virtual environments, how does that change the value proposition for event participants and sponsors? Yeah, so like, I mean, I think that the value proposition for attendees is, um, you know, you have learning, right? So m more robust learning experiences. I prepared so much more, honestly, for this like virtual event thing where it's a medium and I know it's like me and focus and recording than maybe I would have done in a real talk. Um, uh, so I think learning quality gets higher um, and also um, it gets tighter because people know that they can't talk for an hour, you know, in a room, like they could in a room. Uh, so learning quality goes up and that's higher on the engagement side. And then on sponsorship side, I think that um, sponsors now, because it's all content, 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 right? Sponsors can now actually get their messages and find value in learning and sharing what they know and their insights. Um, and it's a more, and because you're already on the internet, it's like a click away to back into their web page, right? So I think that the value there is that um, they're going to be more integrated into content and also um, much closer to the conversion cycle because we're, you know, on the same platform of the internet. Yeah, definitely. Great. Um, Lois is asking about we talked a bit about using a couple different tools in one event. There seemed to be potential and challenges. I was also interested in the in-person power needed to run a larger event for over a hundred people. Um, and, and so for the in-person power, um, I don't know if Lois is here and can clarify a little bit of that, um, but the, I mean, in person, the kind of experience that you need, I guess, in a hybrid event, is that what? Sorry, I just meant if you're running an event for 100 people and say you've got some sessions running, like how many people do you need in the background to make it run smoothly? Right. So there's so many different variables, um, like a hundred person show could be run by one person and a hundred person show, like I've worked on hundred person shows that were run by, you know, upwards of 20 people. So, um, because we had live stream and sort of your tech team is like five to eight people right there, your registration team, it's, if it's like kind of like a high end thing, you're putting one person for every 40 people. So there's like another three to four right there. Uh, your marketing team, if you have a different person on every marketing channel that can get up to five people right there. So it just, it really varies more than happy to do a one-on-one -on -one with you. You can, you know, happy to, you're welcome to email me and I'm happy to talk through that with you in, in depth. Um, it's Sarah at happily.io, so super easy to get in touch with me. Yeah, Lois, we learned all about that putting on CMX Global Connect, and Sarah literally held my hand through every step of the way in regards to like the backstage part of like who needs to be there, what's going on, so she will definitely help you out with that. Um, all right, so next we've got a little two-parter from Jessica. So the topics that they discussed was live stream versus pre-recorded, so Sarah, live stream versus pre-recorded, which is best. Um, and then talking about the why is more important than ever between those two. And then the, another question is, how are special events, galas, et cetera, working? So questions on those experience and what platforms that exist. Yeah, okay. So um, live stream versus pre-recorded. If you have a really strong filmmaker and editor, like a really strong one, then um, that can, be better and it also depends on what you're trying to do is the is the purpose to like because the film piece of things is really good with emotional engagement right but the interactivity and the liveness is really good for conversion so it you it depends if you um you're like i need both emotion and conversion which we're all gonna say <laughs> right then um it really it really just depends on the quality of the talent that you have you know, so if you have someone that's not very good or it's like an intern or is like new to filmmaking and editing, um, the power of live is going to win every single time. However, if you have a really a speaker who um, isn't really in touch with your community and the needs of your community or the talent and the performers like don't really hit the mark, then you're going to want to do it would be better to just show 
Beyonce's homecoming, you know, on Netflix and like let that roll than um, than having someone talk about, you know, whatever it is that your your theme is at the time. So I think that's my answer on pre-recorded versus live and why. And then sorry, remind me again, Anne Marie. Oh, the fundraisers, right? So um, fundraisers, yes. the the I tell everyone that the first place to start obviously is writing your script. Um, uh, you first write your script, then you develop your personas based on role. So your donor, your attendee, your organizer. Um, after that, then you're going to think about like what are the interactions and layer that on top of the script. And then you think through the technology. And when you're at that point where you're looking at technology, you know, you're looking for technology that that will complement and service the story, but you're also looking at technology like where does your audience live? So like we helped a um, a group of a nonprofit group in Brooklyn that gives away free masks that is throwing a rave right they're like a bunch of kids like throwing a rave um you know their platform is going to be twitch right um and they're gonna they're going to raise main twitch has these sort of donation functions and features and it makes sense for them because their community is already on twitch you know it would twitch would totally not make sense for another fundraiser that we're working with where it's um predominantly, you know, women in their 50s and 60s that are raising money to turn their region blue, right? And they know how to get onto Zoom. So we make Zoom work for the story. Um, and that's really the, the best way to go. Um, but the same process, like I shared, is like write your script, then write the code, and then write and build the code to be able to support that message or what's your call to action then deliver it. Um, that's it. Great, and since we're on um, the topic about Zoom, so another header from Jessica and Lois, um, what are some tips on Zoom that some of us may not know as event producers? Um, and then could you run two sessions at once on Zoom and later have them come together as a larger group? Yeah, so um, I think some tips. I mean, I think that Zoom is like generally like, you know, even here, right? It's like you can only see 36 people at a time, maybe 50, right? So I think Zoom is really best for the small groups. And, and I don't know how your experience was, but I, at least for me, I found that like meeting with small groups in the breakouts is just a wonderful experience. Um, so, you know, plan for time to use what Zoom does best, I think, which is like connecting in small groups um, and think about your, you know, working your content, your interactions in that way. Um, some fun things and that like I've done with like polls, for instance, is that like you that brings interactivity to the poll experience is actually like asking folks like to submit suggestions for like um, for ideas for options to select inside the poll. So, you know, rather than you as like the community organizer or host or moderator sort of pre-setting, you know, what people can select from, let your audience like tell you like what they're interested in and then run the poll as a group and like sort of distill. So that's one thing to think about. Um, breakout rooms is an effing nightmare in Zoom um, when you are trying to pre-assign. So avoid trying to like um, avoid pre-assigning in one main room with breakout rooms. Um, what you're going to need to do is actually think about the assignments beforehand in the registration and the capture there at that point um, and probably set up like multiple Zoom rooms or use another platform um, that like is specifically designed for that type of interaction. Great. Um, and we have a question from Santosh. Um, what are three best engaging activities in virtual events? How to hold the audience from start to end? Coming from a filmmaking background, I understand the scripting is good, but any other quick tips? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, hey Santosh, like thanks for that question. I think that like the, um, the personas is a really important um, exercise to go through. Um, if you haven't gone through persona building, that is essential um, because what's going to work best is the thing that is really, you know, focused and, and meets the needs of the particular like cohort or the type of person that you're that you're reaching for. Um, but I think that like, you know, some quick quick tips on like getting engagement 
is just a lot of like over over communication and per, and like giving permission over and over and over again it's really funny but like people are so like is it okay for me to do this you know so do everything that you can in order to let people know before during after design your experiences like even in the way that we did now to like make it like less scary to interact um and less scary you know again goes back to the personas it could be fear of technology it could be you know like uh fear of sort of just just being visible you know there's there's a lot of people who don't feel comfortable like being on video and and coming up and saying things so always you know always sort of plan for your interactions to be one that's the most inclusive great um all right so last question here um, how are virtual events going to fill the gap for multi-day conferences and trade shows? Virtual events for multi-day conferences and trade shows. Um, well, I think that at least what we're seeing, you know, from our, you know, our customers who are focused in those areas um, is that they're taking their multi-day event and they are blowing it up across like a quarter long or a year long program. Um, and the conversations are getting, um, again, much more focused and, and also uh, focused by cohort, right? So I think that um, that'll be true of cohort when you're talking about on the conference side of things. And then on the trade show piece of things, the one-on-one -on -one interaction and helping to set up those um, conversations. So small webinar to like do demo, right? Or maybe videos that are pre-recorded and sent, you know, around to a demo, but then the one-on-one -on -one, um, is a really important engagement. That is the engagement that trade show people are buying into essentially, <laughs> right? To talk, have like experience with their customers. So organizers are going to um, need to get like a lot savvier about thinking, um, thinking around how do they, how do they deliver that one-on-one -on -one experience to their customer, uh, to their trade show, you know, sponsors and exhibitors, but also track the ROI, you know, for, for all of that. So um, it could be some more capture um, and more code that you're going to write in the post, in the follow-up, um, as well as in the during, than, than you might be used to. Great, Sarah. We definitely need all that information you've got on tracking ROI and making sure sponsors and everything are all get all of that good stuff and we can really prove value to all these virtual events that we're, you know, putting on right now. Um, cannot thank you enough for joining us today. Really appreciate your time and um, everything. So we'll just be sure to, you know, keep following happily and make sure that, you know, we're just watching what you guys do and all the cool stuff and reach out to you when we, when it's time. Thanks so much for having me. It was really great. I love the CMX community and so i um, happy to be a part of it. And, um, you know, it's just a really evolving conversation. I gave a backstage tour like conversation last week and this one is so much more like informed than the week before. So I'm really excited to continue um, continue learning from everyone, you know, and, and developing this uh, this new medium together.